Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is tall. <laughs> Welcome back to an exciting episode of Eggs. Today's special guest is Marcus Bell, aka Bell Ringer. Marcus is a music producer, songwriter, multi instrumentalist, singer, social media influencer, best selling author, activist, and entrepreneur. Marcus got into music early, learning the piano at just two years old. His interest in music carried him well into his teens and adulthood, where after a brief stint in the record industry, working for titans like Universal Music and later BMG, his entrepreneurial drive set him on a path all his own. As an independent creative technologist, Marcus has promoted, produced, remixed, and written for some of the world's best-known superstars and brands. His list of credits include artists like Nicki Minaj, Snoop Dogg, and Timbaland, and companies like Sony Music, HBO, Netflix, Amazon, and more. Obviously, we've had a ton of ground to cover, so let's get going. Joining us today for an exciting conversation about growing up musical, finding and pursuing an entrepreneurial life, and working with some of the biggest artists and brands in the world. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Marcus Bell, a.k.a. Bell Ringer. Hey, Marcus, how are you, man? Uh, fantastic. So great to be here with you. Absolutely. Yeah. We're thrilled to death. Thank you so much for making time for us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so let's start off at the beginning, at the ripe old age of two years old. Um, <laughs> you started playing the piano at two. Uh, that's really early. And uh, I really impressive. Can you tell us about your, your background in the music from there? Sure. So, uh, so from what I understand, it started when I was in the womb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my, my, my parents had a, had music playing beside the bed. Uh, they were pumping jazz and classical music into the womb. Right. Uh, um, and so so I, I, I think it's been, you know, music has been wrapped into my DNA in such a way that it, at two years old, when they noticed that I had this ability to focus for long periods of time, it sparked in from, as a family story goes, my father said, why don't we try him on piano? <laughs> and so I just remember sitting on a piano on top of phone books and sitting at the piano. And whenever I touched the keys that the world would disappear. And so uh, that ability to, to focus and, and um, which I have been using all my life in, in different ways and in my entrepreneurship and learning and studying different disciplines from marketing and sales and, and, uh, you know, creating social media followings and, and all these different areas that I'm, I'm interested in, that two-year-old Marcus sitting there pressing the first key. Now, usually kids, when, you know, I have a, a, a six-year-old and when she was two years old, she would go and bang on the, the keys of the piano. But me, um, I remember touching the keys intentionally. And that's kind of like entrepreneurs, right? So there are some entrepreneurs that just kind of bang, or bang on the <laughs> piano business. And then there are others that intentionally dig into whatever their offer is. So it, it, it started there. It started when I was, I was uh, two. And then by the time I was six years old, uh, that's when I got my first check. 
and um, for being in the entertainment industry. And I opened up a bank account. Um, you know, I, they they took me down to to the bank, and I remember sitting there with my my mother. And there's this banker, and I have this check for like six hundred and fifty dollars, and I'm giving it to the banker, and I'm trying to understand what is <laughs> happening here. <laughs> Right. What is going on? So I give you this check and what happens? OK, you just can not I just keep that, <laughs> you know, like that. And so, yeah, so my 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 um, coming into the entrepreneur world, into the business world happened very early. Yeah, um, I, I like that. You, one thing you said there that when you would sit down and play the piano, the world would disappear. And um, I. I actually play the piano as well. I, I started at a later age. I would think I was five or six when I started, but I was taught Suzuki method, which is uh, mm -hmm. ear training. And uh, I played all through high school and classical for, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And I used to, uh, I would sit down and I would just play for hours and the world would disappear. It just, all the problems went out. I could actually think while I was playing, there was just mm. something to it to where if I was having a problem or something going on, I'd sit down and play the piano and, I could usually sort my way through it. So I, I like that you pointed that out. Yeah, well, well, the, the thing about that, um, which is so important, I think, now in terms of, you know, what's happening in the world and in, in regard to like music education and things like that, like the the importance of having that type of outlet. Yeah. See, most people relate to music as a as an entertainment vehicle, but music and learning an instrument, whether that's piano or any instrument, some or or doing any kind of art that requires some type of focus, there's the opportunity for uh, for emotions and to be expressed. Yeah. There's an opportunity for healing to happen. There's an opportunity for whatever that practice is to be one that is kind of like meditation, right? So, so, you know, when we look at things like flow state, like what puts people in the flow state where the world disappears, like I didn't have the language for it. Then I, I just experienced, oh, the world disappears when I play the piano and I'm not being, you know, focused on me or focused on some problem or focused on something like that. The world disappears. The same thing happens, you know, for, for authors, right? You know, like whatever there is where a place where there's some type of creation happening right whatever that is if if you're in a place where you're able to create something and you just need to put all your attention on that creation there's an opportunity for flow state for for anyone yeah yeah i think that's great so i wanted to ask you so i mean obviously naturally inclined towards music i mean you and if for no other reason than the fact that you were able to sort of channel your focus on the things that drew your interest when you were young so, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, both your parents were pretty accomplished people. Your mother was a national cha tennis champion and your father was entrepreneurial also. Can you talk at all about just sort of the role that having good parents or having a support system, whatever that looks like, uh, played in your success in terms of, you know, you, you mentioned the bank account issue, right? Or the bank account story. You know, this was, you, you had a parent who was involved enough to make sure that you got that, but not everybody gets that. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that, how influential their role was in, in your success but also how people, you know, who maybe don't have that could build a support system of their own. Yeah. So my, my parents provided me two examples. It's kind of like the, uh, the rich dad, poor dad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> type of thing. Um, because my mother also would focus on something for long periods of time. Right. So, so she was a, 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 a national tennis champion. And so I think her flow state would definitely happen when she played tennis, right? Right. When yeah. she was interacting in, in a, a tennis environment. And then my dad was a serial entrepreneur. So he would, he would start, I mean, I mean he started so many different businesses, <laughs> you know, it. so he would, uh, there was a restaurant business, there was a upholstery business, there was a, a pool shop where people would, would play pool. And then, you know, there was a record store and then there's the trucking company and then there's the, you know, like that. So, so he would kind of be all over the place in terms of his entrepreneur, his creativity really. 
And so then he started DJing when he was like in his, uh, you know, 60s. Right. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, like that. And so so there was that. And then there was my mother who was a civil rights activist and she would write grants and then she she would study when she was writing grants for organizations. She raised millions of dollars for different organizations, but she would become basically a field expert in that topic that she would write a grant in, right? So she would read all the books. She would engage in conversations with uh, the thought leaders in that space, really understand uh, what the needs were and then be able to communicate and articulate that. And I would see her spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and months deep diving into a specific subject. And so I got that from her, right? I got that ability to, uh, to deep dive into the areas that, um, that are of importance. And, and I, I help support, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and leaders and, and people to, uh, to do the same thing. So I've created some systems and, and some programs like Wealth and Impact Bootcamp, where I've put in the specialized knowledge um, and experience that I've had you know, from the beginning, uh, I've found a way to, to capture that so that it's useful for people so that they can actually apply that uh, inside of their lives. So uh, as is, you know, commonly stated that once someone starts studying a topic for, uh, for a, a period of time, you know, whether that's reading, you know, 50 books on a subject, right? you start to gain some expertise in that area. And so inside of dialing in and focusing your energy and effort on something that's important, if, you, if you're trying to learn marketing, for example, you know, what are the top 20 marketing books? Consume them. What are the top 20 marketing podcasts? Consume them. What are the top, you know, like this show, right? Uh, yep. yeah, this should be a part of your breakfast. <laughs> right? with eggs <laughs> yeah i love that right so so like that where you start creating these practices to expand and build your specialized knowledge in an area that will make the biggest impact in your life in your business etc and so uh so yeah yeah one thing i'd like to sort of pick out of there actually and you didn't say it exactly out loud but through through saying your father was sort of serial entrepreneurial and he was trying lots of things also given your mother's experience in both civil rights and as an athlete it seems like there was probably a lot of um a, i don't know try and fail right there was a lot of opportunity where you go out and you just give it a shot and if it didn't work you know especially early in civil rights for example i mean you know not everything you tried to push through the government worked or you know as it pertained to being an athlete you know you don't you don't serve perfectly every time you've got to put in the, the reps and you've got to, you know, but you have to be willing to accept failure as a piece of this growth, right? Mm -hmm. Same civil rights. And also with sort of the idea of civil uh, serial entrepreneurism, you know, people who do start and stop a lot, right? It's usually, I think that I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's like most people's fourth or fifth shot before they have a business that's actually successful, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, mm -hmm. you know, um, I wonder if you could talk about that, especially as a musician and having the freedom, I guess, to try and fail. I mean, your parents obviously created an environment for you where failure was safe. Like it was a safe thing to, to not be perfect the first time. And I wonder if you just sort of talk about that experience. Yeah. Well, uh, before I talk about that, I want to go back to the environment because I, I, I think the environment that my parents provided, because my parents divorced, okay? And so, uh, and there was a period of time that my father wasn't in my life, right? And so my mother, um, in her brilliance, basically reached out to different people that she thought would be good mentors for me and said, okay, you know, Marcus's dad's not around, let me actually build an environment for him to be able to thrive and grow and develop and learn the things uh, that he would learn from a male mentor, Love it. right? And so I had, uh, you know, one of my mentors was the president of the Family Channel. Another mentor was an executive over at Eminem Mars. Another mentor, you know, like, like that. My, my uncle uh, was, you know, uh, stepped up in, and became uh, hugely a part of uh, the shaping of, of me. Uh, he's a politician and a real estate 
you know, um, you know, a successful real estate entrepreneur. And so, so, but that environment is crucial. Yeah. Right. And if you're not born into that environment, giving yourself the gift of creating that environment is crucial. So, so, so we have the opportunity to design an environment for our success. And so, um, so that environment is, is, is crucial. And then what was essential inside of that environment was the space for what you're pointing to of being able to learn. And the best way to learn is to not have something be successful because you can learn. Yes, you can learn from success, but you gain wisdom from the failures. And so, so the way failure, I had to develop a relationship with failure because my mother had this mantra around failure that was, there's no such thing as failure. There is only learning experiences. So anytime I had something that looked like a failure, right? It was reframed into a learning experience. And then so, so when something didn't happen the way that I had planned for it to go and I've experienced lots of that in my life, in my entrepreneurial life, things that, that didn't work out the way I had designed and planned for it to happen. And, and even in my personal life, like right now I'm going through a divorce, right? So, so that that's, is, is provided the most impactful learning experience going through a divorce. Yeah. It's, prob- it's the biggest growth period that I can identify in my life, right? as I've become more and more in tune with my emotions, uh, what it is that I'm doing in the world and the impact that it has on, on, um, on my bigger, big purpose and who I select to uh, be in relationship and romantic relationship with. Again, it, it comes back to environment, right? Um, and now as I start thinking about like a future relationship, making sure that I'm in an environment uh, inside of a relationship that supports the big things that I want to do uh, to impact the world, right? Mm-hmm. I was in a perfect marriage for where I was when I got married. And then now there's a, a new environment that's required for what I'm doing now in my life. And, uh, and so, so like that, so the, the failure of a marriage has provided a tremendous amount of learning Right. So I've, I, I know so much about relationships now that I can help so many people around relationships because it wasn't that, you know, uh, so the successes in a relationship I learned from, but the failures in a relationship I learned more from. Yeah. And the same thing with business, uh, because in each situation where there's a failure in business, I would say, OK, well, you know, where was I responsible for this? Right. What? could I have done differently, (laughs) right? Uh, What was in my control? What was out of my control, right? What gaps were there that had this occur? What did I not know that I know now, right? And then there's the world of not knowing what you don't know, right? I don't know what I don't know, that world, right? And now I know that I didn't know that (laughs) right and so it's like so it's like really being in an inquiry around situations successes and failures a lot of times people you know don't like to look at the failures i love looking at the failures because that's where i can really grow and expand my specialized knowledge uh on whatever that thing is that i that didn't go the way i planned yeah i like that um i'm gonna slaughter the quote but it's something like you're Reality can be changed, um, and no reality is. Anyways, you can change your reality by changing your mind. So, uh, if you, I like that you, when you started that portion, that segment there, you said that someone can um, create their own environment to learn, and I, I think that that's 
you know, if you, if you want to learn a topic, if you want to learn advanced mathematics or about hydrogen energy or this or that, go read a blog, go, go watch some YouTube videos on the subject, go read the top 20 books. Just like you said, it's very important to understand and have the self-awareness that you can actually teach yourself something. And that to me, that, that stood out. Uh, speaking of education, um, you went to Berkeley. Uh, can you tell us about your experience there and how um, that college experience helped you in your career with, with music? Yeah. So when I went to Berkeley, I, I already had a company, okay. right? I had a record label that I started when I was 12. Nice. And so, so I, I was hiring my teachers uh, to be my backup musicians, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so when I went to Berkeley, it was a, uh, a uh, quite unexpected, actually. Um, there was a woman I was dating. I was going to Virginia Commonwealth University at the time. And I, I was like, okay, I got to learn business. I want to learn as much as I can about business. And then uh, at the same time, I was taking some music courses there and I was studying under um, this, uh, the head of the music department there, who's an incredible composer. And so, so I was learning a lot and writing uh, orchestrations for big band and orchestra. <laughs> and I, so I was learning all of that. And so he said, when I, uh, I was dating this, this woman that was a part of that music program, and she's like, I always wanted to go to Berkeley when I, you know, since I was in high school and so forth. And I was just like, oh, okay, that's cool. Well, you should apply for Berkeley. You should really go for it. Right. Um, cause I, I believe, you know, why wait, go for what it is that you want now. A lot of times people say, okay, I have to do this before I can do that. No, just go straight to the that. Right. Yeah. And so, so I, so I was saying to her, okay, go to the that. <laughs> if you, you know, you don't have to do an in-between and, and, and hope and wish, like you can apply. So she got the application and when she got the application, she said, oh, Marcus, the application came. Oh, you should see this brochure. Can let's look at it together. So I looked at it and it had a music business program. I was like, what? There's a music business program? And it had like the studios. I was like, what? It has studios? What? And I just started looking and looking. I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I'm trying to design myself here. I'm taking business. I'm performing. I am, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to work with with inside of the music business there. I didn't have any mentorship around the music business um, at the time. So uh, now I provide that for a lot of people, but I didn't have that myself, <laughs> right? So I would go into a record store and see, oh, wow, uh, there's posters here. And then I go back and, and say, okay, I need to get some posters for the record store, right? So I was, fig I was figuring out that way. Well, when I sat down with, with uh, my girlfriend at the time and and I saw all of that, this feeling came over me. It was like, it was like something from the universe said, Marcus, you're supposed to be in Boston. <laughs> How is your music? <laughs> and it made zero sense. <laughs> right? I'm like, whoa, it made sense, but it didn't make sense at the same time, right? It, it, because I had so much going on there in Virginia and with my businesses and, and performing, I had, I was building an audience. I was on the radio. I was get I was in a newspaper often, you know, I, I had a, a really a solid base that I was growing. And then I had inside of me something that said, no, you're supposed to go to Boston. And so when I um, told the chair of the music department there at VCU, that I was planning on doing that, he said, oh, you don't have to, you know, you, you, you have access to everything you need now, right? Right, you have access, anything that you would learn there, you have access to already. And, um, and so, uh, so yeah, so in the, in the face of all of that, she ended up not going and I ended up going. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so when I went to Berkeley and, and you know, just saw all the uh, 
you know, I was a child prodigy. And so I, I started interacting with other child people that came from a child prodigy background. Uh, others that had as much experience as I did, I felt at home, right? And, um, and so my aim at Berkeley was to really build my specialized knowledge and build community. And I was fortunate to be able to do that uh, because when I was at Berkeley, um, you know, the way I got that job at BMG, um, I heard you, you know, mention earlier was I was in a hallway and a friend of mine that was working at BMG and he was excelling, you know, tremendously at that job, right. That they had promoted him. And so, so they, yeah, he's, he walked past me in the hallway. He said, Hey, they're, they're sending me to Chicago. You want my job? <laughs> yeah. Now I never worked for anybody before, except for like, you know, when I was a musician playing at churches and so forth, I was just like, huh? Yeah. Okay. And that's how I got the gig at BMG. That's awesome. Well, and, and so that actually makes me, I mean, it's, yeah, I want to grab a bunch of pieces of your story and kind of put them together and see if we can figure out how to make this something applicable for other folks. Okay. So, I mean, you mentioned early on with your family, especially the I, the environment that your family had built for you, you know, through mm -hmm. circumstances, good and bad and divorces and all these things. Nonetheless, you had an environment built around you that allowed for safety and security. It gave you, you know, permission to fail. It allowed you to work hard on the things that drew your attention, uh, you know, all the sorts of things that you would need. Now, as you're talking about going to, to Berkeley School of Music, you're talking about sort of similar things, right? You're surrounding yourself with people who are sort of like you or, or at least, you know, in the musical vein, you know, they other prodigies or other people who are really into music, right? And so you start surrounding yourself with them. You start me, you know, and now at this point, I guess by this age, you're sort of crafting your own environment, right? You've moved from the one that your parents built for you to the one that now you're crafting for yourself. And yeah. as a result, you're you're meeting people, you're making connections, you're doing all that kind of thing. So I wanted to talk to you about sort of, you know, I guess to to examine that idea a little bit more, the the power of networking and, and the importance of maybe, you know, who it is you surround yourself with. You know, folks yeah. have said in the past, you know, this idea that you you are sort of the sum of the five people that you hang out with the most, right? So the idea being you should try and build yourself a, a community of, you know, like-minded people or successful people or whatever it is to sort of, you know, I, I guess help steer your ship a little bit. And I've always had the attitude, attitude also that it's just the opposite of that, right? That you should be working to be good enough to be somebody's top five, right? You should be trying to get on their list. And uh, and so I wonder if you just talk a little bit about sort of, I, I guess, the role networking played. I mean, obviously it landed you at BMG, but also how it continued to help you as you progress through the music industry. Uh, both Mike and I have a little bit of uh, background knowledge in the music business. Both he and I have worked with bands and promoted shows and managed groups and actually owned little labels and things too. And, um, you know, not at very large scale, but, you know, we have a little bit of, of common understanding there, but we, we also happen to know from that experience that, you know, it, so much of that business anyway is who, you know, and I think that that's sort of life in general. So I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about just sort of your experience as it pertains to crafting your own environment and then building a network of people. Yes. So, the people that you surround yourself with are a part of an environment, right? So the, the five people that is the common thing, you know, what you pointed to is partial and incomplete, right? Because, um, Literally, your physical environment also impacts things, yeah. right? So, so there are these different aspects of environment. There's the, the physical environment, which could affect your sleep, that could affect uh, how you feel when you are doing your work, whether it's... Uh, you know, entrepreneurial work or creative work, you know, there's a, a big difference for me walking out to the beach and getting a, the Pacific Ocean. I'm here in LA, right? The Pacific Ocean, right, as an environment versus downtown, right? Where people, or, or when I was living in New York, in Manhattan, 
right? That's a completely different environment that inspires a different energy that has me behave and probably walk faster than I do at the beach, right? So the physical environment can impact your behavior um, and then that behavior will impact your thinking. And that thinking will impact how you communicate and the way you communicate will impact the relationships you attract. And the relationships you attract impact the opportunities that you have. And the opportunities that you have become a magnet for either more opportunities, bigger opportunities, and those bigger opportunities become a magnet for greater impact that you can make in the world. And so, so um, you know, there's a, a Gandhi quote that I remixed that starts with environment. And because as far as I can tell at this point in my journey, that starting with environment, you know, uh, makes such a such an impact on everything else, right? So if your if your physical environment is not one that's designed to support people coming to spend time with you, for example, then there's a problem in your environment, right? For building community, right? If I'm dating and I'm not comfortable with my physical environment, that's gonna impact when I take somebody, you know, for dinner yeah. at my house or not. Yeah. Well, even, right? Even like a, a cluttered house, for example, like it, you can't yeah. have, you can't be like organized as a business or this or that if your dishes aren't done or you're, you know, it's just something about it. You know? um, yeah. Yeah. It creates like an incompletion. If there's something incomplete in your environment, right? Regardless of how you're focusing in the background is like, oh, I need to wash the dishes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh, right. That's running in the background. And so, 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 th so yeah, so th this is, this is crucial. So when, when I went to Berkeley, I was very conscious about environment. Um, and I, I didn't have the distinctions around it that I do now. And that I, you know, put inside of like the hundred days impact challenge, which is all about creating environment. And, and a lot of the things that we're talking about here, like there's a system that I have in place inside of hundred days impact challenge where people that join the 100 Days Impact Challenge, you know, they they land in an environment, just like me going to Berkeley put, put you know, I put myself in an environment. I've created opportunities for people to select themselves into an environment, right? So whether that's Wealth and Impact Boot Camp or whether it's 100 Days Impact Challenge, like I've set up environments for people to perform at a high level, to go for their dreams, to go for their most important aims. But th this is what I did when I went to Berkeley. I said, okay, I stayed on campus, right, in the dorms. So that allowed me access to a social environment. But I also had a, an apartment outside of the dorms, which I put a studio because I needed to create a work environment because I'm running a company, yeah. right? So, I, so I, I was renting this house that turned into a studio and my office. And so... So I, so I had two environments happening, one that was my creative and business environment, and then one was, was a social and community and learning environment. And so I had the learning environment, and then I had the practice environment. So whatever I was learning, I was applying into the world, right, um, and doing everything needed around that succeeding, failing, <laughs> you know, learning, seeing where the gaps were, all those things that we've, we've been talking about, right? So, but those are, those are set up environments and physical spaces for me to, uh, to engage in that activity. Yeah, that no, I love that. I think, yeah, I think that's really critical, especially, you know, for people right now, I spend a lot of time kind of in and around the remote work world, right? And this is kind mm -hmm. of a forever problem, right? People, mm -hmm. you know, try and work from home, especially now during, you know, COVID and things like that, people start working from home and there's no delineation between their work life and their home life, right? right. They, I mean, the computer is on the table. Like, you know, I'm, I'm staying up all hours of the night working. I, you know, there's yeah. no distinction between spaces and, and maybe not everybody has the opportunity to 
you know, live in the dorms and also afford an apartment or something, but, you know, maybe they go to a, a classroom that's a, you know, there's nobody in class at that time of night or something, or maybe they go use the, uh, the lecture halls or the cafeterias or whatever as their workspace. And then they have their social space back in the dorm or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. So I think adaptation is a big part of it. And I truly love that distinction, this idea that in building your environment, I think there is a lot of focus on this, you know, five people in your social group or whatever, that kind of thing. And I think sometimes that argument becomes a little bit more like, you know, the people you're selecting, what can they do for me? And I think what I like about the way that you're differentiating it here is that sure people play a role, right? So there's a a piece of that that, that is really important, but it's not the whole thing. And, uh, and I've actually, I mean, it's funny because I've actually never really heard it put this way where there's, you know, other aspects of that, you know, and, and, you know, like you're even just talking physical environment. So, but what that got me thinking about was, you know, what about for people who maybe, uh, you know, are underprivileged or come from a difficult family situation, difficult life situation, you know, they don't have leadership or guidance, maybe at the parental level or, or something where they're not getting what they need to sort of even you mentioned earlier, not knowing what you don't know, right? So for a lot of people, they just they just don't know that there is other options or there are other opportunities for them. So you know, I, you've mentioned your your program and how that is one solution to this problem. Mm-hmm. But how do you get, I guess, get people through the door in the first place? And I know you've done a lot of work with like underprivileged schools and things like that. And so I wonder, like at the student level, like you know, assuming a kid can at least muster the energy to show up to school, how can you convince them or? I, not even convince them, but allow them to uh, discover on their own the importance of building this environment so they can start making steps to improve their lives, even if life sucks at home. Listen, life can suck at home as an adult. <laughs> right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, so as far as I can tell with human beings, it all starts with a desire. Yeah no matter where you are in your development, whether that's you're a baby and you desire a bottle of milk, <laughs> right? Or whether that's you are a, uh, a senior that is desiring something to do with their lives now, after retirement and after, you know, their, their kids have left and like, it, it comes with a desire. And so where someone can, have the ability to evoke desire to where there's the opportunity to uh, create a space for aspiration, right? And part of that is is, is uh, exposure, right? So inside of someone being exposed to something, your desire comes from exposure, right? So if if I uh, am not exposed to, uh, for example, all right, uh, let's look at when I was in Richmond in at VCU. Now, I came from a humble means, right? I didn't, I didn't know it, but you know, I, yeah, because money wasn't a conversation in, in that in the way that I'm talking about it now. But when I was in Richmond, I recognized that I, I mean I wasn't living like a multimillionaire as a student in a dorm in Richmond on the 18th floor, right? But I knew that there were some neighborhoods where there were mansions. And one of the things that I did when I was there on the weekends, me and my girlfriend, we would drive whatever beat up little car I had into those neighborhoods and dream and dream and dream. And so, so there evoke a desire, a desire for, uh, you know, a different environment, a different situation. And so the, the whole thing around you know, the, the, the word I'm underprivileged uh, is problematic to me um, on a bu- bunch of different levels and is, is used culturally and so forth because um, no matter what your privilege is, if you have a desire and a mindset to, and you're a seeker of 
an opportunity to live into a full potential, your full potential, you know, inside of yourself, you're not doing everything you can to live into a full potential, then, and you have no relationships of, of stature or, or access to mentors, whatever. There's a friend of mine. Uh, he says this all the time. He, his father wasn't there. And the books he read were his father's. I like it. He didn't have mentors. The books he read were his mentors, right? And so you can actually, no matter where you are in the socioeconomic uh, position in the world, you can get a mentor through a book. You can get a mentor through a YouTube channel. You can get a mentor through a podcast, right? So, so if someone is carrying wisdom and, and, and you have this desire to improve upon some area of your life and you recognize, wow, this is someone that has some wisdom that could mentor me. You may not have access to them directly, but you may have access to their books, to their other representations in the world. And so, um, so it starts, as far as I can tell, with that desire. And then you start organizing the world around that desire. Okay, if I have, so when I was uh, $75,000 in debt, right? And I recognize, wow, something I'm doing is not working here that has me broke, okay? <laughs> well, I'm concerned about paying, you know, rent, all right? And having to borrow money from my mom and, and all, all of this to, to make rent in between gigs and all of that, you know, using a credit card to pay off, another credit, like all the, all, I was doing all the things, right? <laughs> It took me getting into a place where it's like, you know what? This has to stop. I have to change my circumstance, right? This is not going to work. I can't afford to take someone out on a date to a nice restaurant <laughs> without being stressed on it. Like, this is not going to work, <laughs> right? And so, so that desire to change my circumstances had me say, okay, wait a minute, this is something that I am not trained in. How do you actually build wealth? Well, the first thing I need to do is figure out how to get out of debt. <laughs> how do you get out of debt? So what did I do? I went and I got every book that I could find around that. The next thing, I started interacting with people differently. So what do you do when you get a big check? All right, I started asking people, yeah, what do you do when you get a big check, All right? Why? Because once I was out of debt, I got a big check and I didn't know what to do with the check, <laughs> right? So I had to start asking people then. So there's different stages as, as you're building wealth, right? You know, you get to what you know at one stage, you know, will get you past that stage and then you enter another stage, right? So out of debt stage. And then there's the, okay, now how do I actually build wealth stage? And so, uh, and this is one of the things that I help people with, right? Because I've recognized the stages and I've created a system for that. Um, and so some, some people that have been in my programs have become financially independent. Some people in my programs have left their jobs and created entrepreneurial endeavors where they're, they're now having thrive, thriving business and making more than they were making at their jobs, right? So, so it's not like that there's some rocket science around this. There's just... Uh, you know, when you plug into proper mentorship, when you plug into people that have specialized knowledge in areas that you don't, when you plug into and put yourself in an environment of training and development and, and that pulls you into your full potential or the desire to reach that full potential, that's when all the difference gets made. Like that. Uh, you've mentioned it uh previously, but the 100 day challenge, can you maybe break that down for us what it is? Um, and how people can get involved with that? Yeah, so, um, so every Monday, inside of the 100 days impact challenge, there's a an impactors inner circle. Okay. So what I was saying about seeking specialized knowledge and mentorship and, and all of that, that's a part of the challenge. So every Monday I bring on a guest that I interview that's 
I've had Olympian athletes on it. I've had pop stars on it. I've had, you know, uh, nine figure entrepreneurs and ministers and people that have uh, created great works in the world. And inside of that, you know, high performance, we talk about high performance, we talk about wealth building, we talk about all of that uh, every Monday in the Impactors Inner Circle. And so, so again, all the things that I've learned and I had to put myself in, into an environment for, um, I've created these courses and uh, the 100 Days Impact Challenge has a course, a mini course inside of it. When people join it, they get access to that. Uh, they can join the inner circle. They have the opportunity to join the inner circle where they can interact with mentors and, and interact with me and, and interact with people that have specialized knowledge in areas that are important for them because we, you know, we look at who comes into the, the 100 Days um, Challenge and we look at what their challenges are. And so part of what informs who the inner circle guests are is, okay, somebody's working on a relationship. Oh, let me bring someone in that is a, an expert at relationship. Oh, someone is working on, you know, uh, meditation or gratitude. Oh, let me bring someone in that is expert at that, right? And so what I've created there is an environment for people to get at their most important aims. So as a general challenge that, you create what your challenge is going to be. And there's a structure, you get a hundred videos that come to you, you know, every single day, uh, there's a, 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 a private group of support. Cause a lot of times, you know, we don't have people in our lives that are cheering for us, our successes. So we created an environment where, you know, there's a community that's, that's cheering you on as you're going about your challenge. And, um, and yeah, so it's, it's designed with, social psychology and psychology in mind and, and what has people perform at high levels. And if someone has a desire to, whether that's start a new business, whether that's grow their business, whether that's, uh, you know, a physical thing that they want to do, they want to exercise every day. And, and most people, you know, join a gym the first of the year, by the 18th, they stop going, right? So we, so we've taken all those things into consideration, all the things that would stop someone from actually doing the thing that is most important to them. Um, the way I've designed this challenge is for that. It's, it's the 100 days opportunity. We should even change the name from challenge to opportunity, right? <laughs> because it's, it's the opportunity for people to get at their most important aims in their lives, no matter what that is that's important to, for them at that moment. And then there are people in the challenge right now that have, they're on their third challenge. So they, they have been stacking every challenge, something new on top of whether they're offer in a marketplace or behavior that they want to impact. And so, so the results have been tremendous. People have been in the media and have created movements out of the challenge even. There's like the Discover Gratitude movement that got created that has thousands of people that are doing gratitude practices that came out of the 100 Days Challenge. You know, awesome. like that. I like that. Um, I, I like that you're doing stuff like that. You, um, I, I think that this conversation we've kind of talked about, kind of creating your own opportunities, and and you know whether it's a hundred days or three hundred days, if you don't take that first step um, and be consistent with it, uh, you just going to sit on the couch and eat potato chips and <laughs> that'll be your life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you also yeah. wrote a book. Uh, it's called the Bellringer branding Bible. Um, was it, was it the first book to be published on blockchain? Uh, can, uh, I think I saw that somewhere. <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> um, can you tell us yeah, about before, that? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but before we go back, um, before we go there, I want to go back a little bit. See, I, I stand for dignity and compassion for myself and all of humanity, right? So everything that it is that I'm doing in my life comes from that lens, right? Comes from the lens that, you know, we as human beings, we're, we're doing the best we can with our lives, right? And so holding compassion for other human beings and, um, and creating opportunities for for that to be expressed is what I'm all about, 
Love and it. so one of the things that I saw uh, that was missing in the music industry uh, was kind of a guide inside of artist development, right? Where someone could really get underneath brand, right? Like really get at the values and the, the, the design of a mission. And so, uh, so for the artists that were reaching out to me at the time uh, that weren't in a financial position to bring me on as, as a guide or advisor or, or join one of my programs, um, some of the things that, that would constantly come up in conversations that, that people would ask me about, I say, you know what, let me just create a book, you know, four ninety nine, <laughs> right? That provides help that will help someone at least start along the pathway um, and, uh, and, you know, that creates a low barrier to entry right, for the type of thinking that's needed in order to design life, to design your career in entertainment. And so I had some, some CEOs reach out to me that read the book, and I'm like, why did you get the book? It was for, you know, musicians, DJs, art. And they, they said, Marcus, this book is not for DJs and, and singers <laughs> and, and artists and all that. Like, I've read this book and I've sent it to some CEO friends of mine. Like this is a book that that that's is is more powerful than even just the just the music industry as a specialization. Like you know, I read the book and I've gotten so much out of this book myself for my life, and it's fascinating hearing these stories about the music industry. But but this is this is a book that uh, that can help a lot of people, and so um, and that book is is one that I wrote with my mother and. And we were uh, working on it for about five years. Basically, this book is a chapter out of a bigger book that we were working on. Yeah. And um, and uh, Shalita Burke is an, a recording artist that I work with that is an expert in the blockchain space. And she was a, she was a cryptologist and so forth. And we had a music project, uh, her album, uh, her EP at the um, back then, which was released on blockchain and she created a blockchain for that music project where all the collaborators got paid directly and so forth. And so uh, so when I was looking at the book, Shalita said, Marcus, you need to release that book now. <laughs> like there are artists, there are people that need this book now. So whatever it is. So she, she was that, um, you know, one of my five people that was like pushing me, <laughs> right. Say, Hey, okay, go ahead, go for it now. And so, so I said, well, okay, I'll do that. And what can make this unique, right? What can make this unique? And so, so we released it so that people could actually purchase the book using the blockchain. And so, uh, yeah, so that, that was, and it, it was the, the first time that that had been used as an application in the, the book publishing world. And of course that book became an Amazon bestseller in three categories, number one, um, et cetera. And that book was, um, you know, a success that I was able to share with my mother before she died that year that it was released. And she had a stroke uh, later on in that year, and uh, and it, it was it was great to have that um, gift. I'm so glad that I released it. Yeah. Right, that we were able to share in something that we were uh, collaborating on, you know, before she passed. Yeah, no, yeah. that's really great. So um, I wanted to go back, and this is this is going to be a tough one to answer, but I, I wonder if you could maybe help uh, help us out a little bit. So you know, I've been kind of thinking about our conversation and, and smooshing it all together. And we've talked a lot about an environment and things like that. And if I was to drill down deeper on the environment, I think you've been using the word desire a lot, but I think what we're talking about too, or at least in part is this idea of curiosity, being curious about your world. And, and I actually, I sort of scribbled down a little formula here, this idea that curiosity plus desire equals sort of that flow state that we were talking about earlier. 
And so, but, you know, again, and I actually really love your approach to sort of, you know, everybody having sort of equal opportunity in inspiration or, or mindset and, uh, and that, you know, maybe you're not actually underprivileged in that sense. And uh, I think that that's kind of a refreshing view. So, but with that in mind, then I wonder, can we talk at all, or do you have any insights into, you know, creating curiosity where it may not exist? I, I think what happens a lot of times in a, you know, social media rich environment, like we have uh, so many people spend a lot of their, I guess, rev cycles, thinking about what they want through the lens of what they think will trend on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And, you know, they see the guy with the yacht. So therefore I need a yacht, but it's not truly what I want. Rather, it's sort of being spurred on by what I think other people want. Right. And so I wonder if you had any thoughts around just, you know, developing a sense of curiosity in yourself and how to sort of stay true to your message. You know, like in your case, you know, you've managed to stay true to the thing that was important to you throughout your career, you know, in one form or another, you've done many other things, but there's sort of this kernel in the center, you know, you were curious about this thing and this is your thing. And, uh, and maybe you're in a unique case, but I wonder, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking about the individual who maybe doesn't have the drive or isn't sure what they want out of life and that sort of thing. And it's not that they're not capable of having that. It's that they, it just hasn't occurred to them yet. So I, I wonder if you had any thoughts around developing curiosity. Sure. So it's paying attention. It's paying attention to what it is that inspires you. It's paying attention to what is it that upsets you. It's paying attention to emotions that you have as you're trafficking through the day, through your week, as you're exposed to people, right? is paying attention to how you feel. And uh, and then out of that paying attention, so let's say you're in a urban environment and you're walking down the street and you, you notice that there's a homeless population, right? And you pay attention to that and it upsets you, right? Therein lies the opportunity to become curious about that thing, right? And and then take that, I love curiosity plus desire. So then allowing your curiosity to inspire a desire, and I would add after desire to take action, right? And before even taking action, I will put, coming up with a plan so starting with the curiosity right that the environment you notice okay it's like okay let's let's use the homeless example still okay i notice it i'm curious why is this why is it that there are so many homeless people here right why what what is it that has this happen Right. So then then but not leaving it there, then it's like, OK, well, well, let me figure out what that is. Like, let me let me find out. OK, so now now we're now we're starting down a path. Right now I have this desire to, OK, let me either talk to some of them and and see get their world. Right. Or start reading about it or Googling about it or or start. Getting, so so now now I'm starting to uh, to get some information in then you check in okay do i still care about this is this evoking something is there some action for me to take next right then you can start thinking about planning all right so what am i okay i have this desire i'm passionate about it whatever it is okay what is my plan for how i'm going to do something about it right and then say, okay, well, wait a minute. All right, so I could I could find a nonprofit uh, that I could do something about it with someone that's already doing something. I can join, you know, a movement that's already happening. Or do I create my own movement or my own nonprofit? Or do I create some business opportunity that has, you know, this population in mind and creates opportunity to to uh, you know approach it from an entrepreneurial standpoint as opposed to a philanthropic standpoint. Or you may be inspired to, to organize friends around it. So now this is when you start bringing that curiosity, desire, 
and plan into conversation with others, right? So this is where the community comes in. And now, now you're starting to interact with others and they're bringing their inspiration and their, their so forth. Then, then you take that next step. So now it's you inspired, you have some plans and some ideas, and now you have a community that may raise their hand and say, hey, I, I want to join you with that. Like, I care about that too. I care about what's happening in my community, right? Now, it's not just you. Now you have others with you that you're carrying along with you, right? And then you are collaborating together to actually take some type of action. This, I mean, yes, this, this is, this is uh, as far as I could tell, one pathway from going from curiosity by, by just noticing something to actually having that do something in the world that is helpful and can uplift people. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love that story. And it's funny just hearing you talk about it and sort of, I mean, really what I wrote down here was the birth of a movement, right? I mean, you've really yeah. outlined how we get from just being curious or that nor, uh, nugget of curiosity all the way down to, you know, actually literally getting a movement going. And what's, what's interesting is it hadn't occurred to me prior to, the, to this, but um, not, I mean, semi-recently in the last couple of years, uh, we have some friends that live in downtown LA and I took my 14 year old son, well now 14 year old, he was about 10 or 11 then, uh, through downtown Los Angeles. And, you know, obviously it's Armageddon down there right now. It's a, it's yeah. a pretty rough spot. And, uh, but that was, you know, I mean, we live in Salt Lake city and we have a fair amount of, you know, homeless population here as well, but we live out in the suburbs and, you know, he's just not exposed to that very regularly. And when he got down there and saw that, it's exactly what you were describing, right? I mean, he had this sort of urge to, uh, you know, figure out how he could change things for these people. You know, how can I bring humanity to the situation? I want to help these people. So then he came back and he did a little bit of research and he found a local organization. There's one run here by another kid who's, he's 10 years old now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he was like, well, you know, I'm a kid, he's a kid. Together we could go be the super kids on, on this homeless thing, right? And so he mm -hmm. began reaching out and, you know, that's sort of the stage we're at now presently is that he's in communication with this kid. But it's exactly what you're describing, right? It's mm -hmm. he noticed a thing, it ignited an idea in him. He took that back to now seek out some community and additional information. And, you know, who knows where I'll take it from here, but it's exactly what you were describing. And it came so naturally, right? It didn't need a coach. It just mm. happened. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's a, that is a beautiful thing. Yeah. 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 So, so that environment evoked that curiosity, right? And compassion. Yeah. It evoked the compassion. See, underneath the curiosity is, is a compassion that, that, that your, your kid connected to. Uh, one of my mentors calls it the broken heart of compassion, right? That you experience something, uh, Dr. Monica Sharma, uh, you know, which, which I'm, I'm featured in, in her book. It's called Our Radical Transformational Leadership. I highly recommend it for any listener um, to check this book out. But she talks about the broken heart of compassion where you, um, you see something that is upsetting and it breaks your heart that inspires you to action. And so, so your, your son got the broken heart Yeah, and yeah, broken no, it's hearts a lead to great things. Yeah, I love that. Well, cool. So, Marcus, we're we're kind of getting to the end of the hour here. I wanted to uh, just give you an opportunity to let people know, you know, how they can best engage with you if they want to get involved in any of your programs or simply learn more about you and your career. I mean, you know, I guess fortunately and unfortunately, we had a great conversation about other stuff outside of your career, so we didn't really delve deep into the nitty gritty of Snoop Dogs and stuff. But um, but I wonder if you you know folks were interested and wanted to engage with you either on this front, sort of the business coaching front, or if they'd like to learn more about your career or get involved in in perhaps your hundred days of impact uh, movement. Uh, how could people do that? Yes. So so first of all, you know, thanks again for for having me on. Uh, for your listeners, your audience, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Take the opportunity, take a moment and look from the lens of what we've been talking about here and look from the lens of, you know, what can you become curious about if you have not discovered a curiosity for something? We here as human beings have the opportunity. Uh, they say like the highest level of self-actualization a lot of philosophers that I've studied have 
have pointed to is contribution. How can your life be a contribution beyond just you? And so, so if anything that I've said resonates with anybody that's listening, if it resonates with you, uh, and you want to be inside of a community, a community of entrepreneurs, uh, artists, coaches, thought leaders, influencers, uh, business owners, uh, community workers, people that really want to get at making a huge difference in the world and making a big impact and also monetizing that impact, then they would go to wealthandimpactbootcamp.com and and apply uh, for that program, that six month program. If you are someone listening and you have a big thing that you wanna go after, right? And you need a structure and, and you wanna take on a challenge and turn it into a fun thing to do where, where you can put yourself in community and get specialized knowledge and, and, and a system and a, a course to uh, help you design what you need to do, then you would go to 100 Days 2021. And that's days with a Z, 100 days with a Z, 2021. Or if you're listening to this and it's 2025, 100 days with a Z, 2025. If it's 2030 and you're listening to this podcast and you're hearing the sound of my voice, go to 100 days with a Z, 2030 and join the 100 Days Impact Challenge. It's a dollar a day. Easy, right? And then you can also have the opportunity to join the inner circle there. And you can find me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I am spending a lot of my time lately because we just recently launched the LinkedIn Wealth and Impact Bootcamp course that's all focused on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, so, but you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you type in Marcus Bell Ringer, okay, all one word, Marcus Bell Ringer, you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. And I have it open so you can message me there, you can engage with me there, engage with my content. Etc. There on LinkedIn, I know people like, oh, here's my Instagram. Yeah, I have Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I have Twitter. Yeah, I have Facebook. But if you really want to engage with me, go to LinkedIn because that's the platform that I'm focusing on right now. Perfect. Yeah, I love that. Well, th thank you so much, Marcus. We really appreciate having you on. I mean, this is obviously this is a great conversation. I think it, it did a lot of good for a lot of people. Mm. Thank you, yep. and and thank you for the work that you're doing and and bringing. A guest with specialized knowledge to, to help your audience. Uh, it's important work. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tuned in this week and every week. And we'll see you guys next time.